Welcome to Go Big Omaha, our new all-sports studio show. He's John Niatawa. I'm Dirk Chatlin. We are basically Sports Center without talent and resources. John, welcome. <laughs> are you about to throw that football at me? <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous. I'm nervous for several reasons. But. <laughs> yeah, we're, we thought we'd come up with an idea of a way to sort of showcase some of our best work and our best, our colleagues, and, and, and try to talk some sports in a different way, highlight some of the uh, stars, the legends of our city, of our state, and uh, have some fun with it. So that's, what, that's the purpose of the show, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, LeBron, LeBron is king again. The uh, Dodgers and Rays are in the World Series. Patrick Mahomes is, is still running the NFL. But the big news of the week is obviously the return of Big Ten football and, and specifically Nebraska football. It feels like about five years ago when, when Iowa kicked a last-second field goal in Memorial Stadium to, to knock Nebraska out of bowl contention. Uh, the Huskers are back this week. While there's a lot of enthusiasm, uh, it couldn't start much more difficult than it is at Ohio State. John, uh, you know the Buckeyes. You've watched them basically your whole life. Uh, what do you anticipate on Saturday? I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea, but that's okay. I that's think good that's, analysis right there. <laughs> it's honest analysis, and that's what you're going to get on Go Big Omaha. No, I, look, Ohio State's loaded. I was just looking at the draft, the NFL draft from last year, and it seems like every other pick was an Ohio State dude. So obviously the Buckeyes have some talent to replace, but it's a, it's been a program that's reloaded every year. So um, if you're going to play Ohio State, I think I've heard this t- spoken um, numerous times over the last since the schedule was released. If you're going to play Ohio State, you might as well do it in week one when there's a lot of uncertainty and some questions to be answered on both sides, yes, but uh, the, for Nebraska to beat Ohio State or – or keep it close, you, you can't have Ohio State give it to eight games. I think that's pretty clear. So uh, maybe maybe you get a, a Ohio State team that's still trying to figure some things out. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of talk about Nebraska's schedule the first few weeks. I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, you know, Ohio State, Penn State, Wisconsin, those are games that if you can steal even one of them, I think it gives you a huge boost. Um, you were going to play those teams anyway. You might as well play them when, you know, when they're trying to figure some things out too. The, the concern, you know, with Nebraska is, uh, isn't so much going into that environment because that environment isn't, isn't its traditional self at the horseshoe. Uh, it, I think it's just, you know, dealing with that level of talent and the things that you work on in practice, uh, sort of the expectations and the standards that you have in practice they can they can be totally different when you line up against a five a five star. So uh, I think if Nebraska can stay in the game early, kind of get it you know get settled, uh, I think they're going to score points. And I give them a chance if they can kind of weather the storm early. I mean, there's no question that no one's going to play perfectly or even to the top end of their potential. Neither team. But if you're Nebraska, if you can limit those mistakes more so than Ohio State, obviously you have a better chance to, to win. That We're talking about turnovers, penalties, just like uh, precision, the throws, you know, hitting the right hole as if you're a running back and, and being assignment sound defensively. Um, all those little things are going to matter against a team that, you know, I don't think I'm <laughs> saying anything controversial here. More talented, stronger, faster guys um, at, at multiple spots on the field. So. I don't yeah. know, man. Here, here's my question, though. As for for from a Nebraska fan standpoint, do they do? Do you care? Like, how 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 much does the result matter versus just man? Thank goodness football's back. I do think that that's going to be a bigger piece of the emotion than normal. Uh, just the there's going to be a big. I don't want to say sensory relief, but just sort of a sense of you know, normal that you're going to watch a Nebraska football game on a Saturday afternoon. I think the the following week might actually be weirder to see, you know, a game at Memorial Stadium where where there's only a few hundred people in the seats. But uh, I think that'll probably take a little bit of the the typical anxiety or frustration if Nebraska doesn't play well. It'll take some of that away just because we've waited so long and and people have uh, have really put – 
you know, a lot of hope that, that there was going to be some, some sort of football season. And, and frankly, it's been hard to watch these other teams play. So uh, no matter what happens Saturday, I, I do think that people will walk away and say, hey, that was, that was kind of fun to see that again. Yeah, it's going to be – it's still going to be weird seeing uh, a fanless – well, mostly fanless stands at, at, at Ohio State in the horseshoe. Uh, to me, there's – that was – no, I'm not a player. I didn't suit up and step on the field. But uh, from a media perspective, that was the most intimidating environment that I saw or covered a Nebraska uh, football team play in. I, I thought that that place was – what year did they go to? The second year? Yeah, that, 2012. Yep. Mm-hmm, that, that, that Nebraska joined the beach. Unreal, man. Like, especially going into the end uh, where all the students were. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> that, that, no, it's tough. It's tough. But remember, they're just a little bit of source of confidence maybe. But, you know, Nebraska went in there two years ago and, and played really well. They were in the sure. game late. Uh, Scott Frost, you know, called a really good game and, and maybe that can give them a little bit of a boost. So, but yeah, and again, it's not the same environment. So, because there's, there's no fans. Uh, our, our format looks like this: each show we're gonna we'll spend a few minutes at the top talking about news, uh, whether it's college football, college basketball, college baseball, whatever it is, uh, and then we'll build the show around uh, an interview in the middle. And that interview is. Uh, is going to be somebody hopefully that you've heard of. Uh, this week, we're pretty sure that you've heard of him. He, uh, he won 255 college football games and three national championships at Nebraska. Tom Osborne uh, knows how to Zoom with the best of them, and he's, uh, he's far better dressed than us too. So before this college football season, this bizarre college football season, we, uh, we talked to him about a range of issues from Big Ten politics to in-state recruiting to the 1970 national championship team uh, and even trick plays. We had a little fun talking trick plays. So uh, without further ado, uh, introduce Tom Osborne. I was, was hoping you'd tell the story about going out to Malcolm to recruit Larry Frost in the, in the mid 1960s. Uh, well, it was uh, nothing real dramatic. We, uh, we had periodic recruiting meetings where we talked about recruits and, and so uh, in the meeting, uh, we discussed Larry Frost because his name had come up quite a bit. And uh, <clears throat> Bob Devaney said, well, somebody probably needs to go out and watch him play in person because uh, a lot of those eight-man teams didn't have very good video. And, and uh, so I was chosen to go out and watch him play. And, uh, and I did. <clears throat> and I came back the, the next day, and Bob asked me uh, how, how Larry did. I said, well, he carried the ball six times, and he scored six touchdowns. And uh, I said he, he did all he could. And uh, and those weren't really short runs either. I mean, there were <clears throat> some were 30, 40, 50, 60-yard runs. And uh, so Larry, <clears throat> Larry was – one of the bigger guys on the field and by far the fastest person on the field. And, uh, and so he really stood out. And uh, I think when he got to Nebraska, we tried him a variety of places. They tried him on defense. They tried him maybe at running back. And uh, finally he ended up at wingback. And I was coaching receivers at that time. So wingbacks were tight ends, wingbacks, and split ends were my people. And uh, so I coached Larry the, <clears throat> the last couple of years. And and it was kind of a unique combination of abilities because as a wingback, you blocked pretty much like a tight end did. You also carried the ball maybe five, six times a game, mostly on counter plays. Then you're a receiver. And... Um, and so Larry uh, was able to do all of those things very well and uh, played a lot for us as a junior and started some games. And then as a senior, it was really, really was a key player. In 1969, we had had two six and four seasons and the fans weren't happy. Things weren't <laughs> going very well. In 69, we turned things around. We were two and two to start the season. And then we ran off, <clears throat> I think, nine or ten straight wins and beat Georgia rather handily in the Sun Bowl. And uh, 
Larry was a big part of that. So he had a good career at Nebraska, and of course we stayed in touch throughout his coaching career. Tom, I, I always wondered how you, when, when you're recruiting guys like that, how did you evaluate who could make the jump from a small town, eight man field, uh, and who couldn't? For instance, you know, Terry Keneally is a great example of a guy, Hyannis, Nebraska. Um, I don't imagine a lot of Division One evaluators would have liked to go to Hyannis and, and try to figure out what he, he might look like in three or four years. And yet you guys did that routinely where you would take a guy like Larry Frost and you would say, okay, this is what we can do with him. How did you decide which of those guys could make the jump to, uh, you know, major college football and, and which, which of those small town guys could not? Well, I don't, Dirk, I don't think there's a magic formula for, for that, but usually we looked at, at uh, the fact that they were multi-sport players. For instance, Terry uh, was a good basketball player. Uh, he also did some things in track, I think, shot put, discus, and, uh, and of course, Larry was the same. Larry was a, a, a good basketball player. I think he led their team in scoring, and, uh, and he was a great track man. He was second in the 100-meter task in, in his class uh, three straight years. I think he ran a, right right down close to 10 flat 100, which was really good speed, and he had good size. And so uh, you you looked at overall athleticism, and then, of course, generally those, those guys coming from those small towns had a good work. Work ethic and a good character to start with, and uh, and so uh, sometimes it took a while. I mean, it is a big adjustment, and you usually they didn't jump out at you quite as much, maybe their freshman year, but eventually they would turn into really good players. <clears throat> I was curious, Tom, the methodology of evaluating players and maybe projecting a little bit. Did that change for you? over the course of your career or, or did a lot of the kind of principles that you use to evaluate recruits um, stay the same? I, I wonder as, as time passed, did you evolve a little bit as a recruiter? <clears throat> I'd, I'd say it probably stayed pretty much the same. And, and that um, we always started with Nebraska players and, uh, and uh, oftentimes what we would do is uh, any player in the state that we thought had, major college potential, we would offer them right away because they would usually commit. And uh, on average, we'd take uh, six, seven players from Nebraska and give them scholarships. And uh, quite often, these are players that would not be recruited by other schools or maybe lower division schools. But uh, the interesting thing was that the last six, seven years that I coached, I went back and charted those guys. And of those Nebraska players, those six or seven that we recruited, 75% of them started for us. And the average for all of our recruits in state, out state was about 51, 52%. So even though those guys were not what would normally be called four-star, five-star recruits today, we also found that they, uh, we got a better return on investment on those scholarships than, uh, than players that were more at a distance. And, uh, and so I always thought that was a big key to, to uh, what we did was uh, start with our in-state players first. And of course, an adjunct to that was the, um, were the walk-on players and I've, <clears throat> I've said this before, I don't know if this is repetitious or not, but um, back when I became the head coach, we had 45 scholarships, initials. And then that progressively got cut down by the NCAA to the current number of 25 initials. And what we noticed was that when we had those 45 scholarships, sometimes it was the 40th, or the 43rd or the 45th guy that we offered a scholarship to who became our best player. And so that's why we decided, well, you know, this idea of just recruiting 
25 scholarship players is kind of crazy because that remaining 20 or so players that we were recruiting at one time, mostly from Nebraska, uh, quite often turned into really good players. And so that's why we began to recruit those walk-on guys. And we went to see them in their homes. We went to their high schools. We, we uh, recruited them just like, <clears throat> like scholarship players. And, uh, and I think that was a big key to uh, having some success. Tom, you um, the 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 nineteen seventy national championship season is we're obviously commemorating that this fall. Uh, some others are too, and a as I reflect on what happened that season and and sort of research it, uh, I don't want to say that it came out of nowhere because the program was was really good in nineteen sixty nine, but but that was an, an incredible breakthrough and maybe has gotten lost a little bit over the years just because of the success of the 71 team. Uh, what do you recall or what stands out to you about that 1970 championship season? Well, in, uh, in 69, we had some pretty good players on the freshman team. And uh, Johnny Rogers was part of that. You know, and he, uh, he came on the scene in 70. And of course, in those years, uh, Freshmen mostly played on the freshman team. And uh, matter of fact, there was a period of time where they weren't even eligible to play. And uh, so, uh, and then Taggy and, and uh, Van Brownson were sophomores, I believe, in 69 and juniors in 70. They were good players, Jeff Kenny. So we had some really good athletes that came along. And, uh, and so we, uh, Ended up with Goodyear. And a real, really pivotal game, I think you've written about it, was the USC game out there. Because they had a lot of talent. And uh, we, uh, we ended up running quite a few exotic plays, kind of trick plays. And, and uh, for the most part, they all worked. And, uh, but uh, I think we outyarded USC. The, the problem was that we had some turnovers in that game. And... Uh, probably could have, would have, should have uh, won the game. And, uh, but it, uh, that was a pivotal game because I think it, it gave the players confidence that they could play with anybody and, uh, and hold their own and, and beat them. And, uh, and so, uh, and as you know, on New Year's Day, things had to fall right because I think we went into the, that game down at LSU rated fifth or sixth in the country, and two or three teams that were ranked ahead of us lost, and uh, and all of a sudden we were there. And uh, when it came, it was kind of a surprise. Tom, I know you get asked the same questions over and over and over and over, um, and I, I'm certainly guilty of asking those questions too, but but I this is my attempt at asking you one that, you've, that you have not been asked before, and that is with all your trick plays, uh, from fumble rooskies to – you know, I back passes to everything else. Is there one that you never called uh, that you that you didn't quite have the courage to call, or the situation wasn't quite right that you that you always kind of wondered about or regretted? Uh, because you you always had you know three or four in your back pocket, uh, mm -hmm. and I wonder if there was ever one that you that you just didn't quite have the the nerve to call. No, I, I think we ran them all, <laughs> Dirk, because, you know, I, would, I know that sometimes people will use a formation or a play or something in practice, and they'll practice it over and over again and never use it. But I always felt that if you're going to practice it, you better use it, because otherwise you're just wasting time. And uh, so I, I, I don't remember any play that we ever worked on it was sort of exotic that we didn't at some point run and um, we're kind of lucky because uh, some of those plays would have really looked bad like for instance the fumble ruski when the ball's laying on the ground also all the center has to do is kick it or somebody mishandles it and all, all of a sudden it looks terrible but uh, fortunately every time we ran it it worked and uh, i think we ran it four or five times and of course, eventually that play got to where the officials uh, pretty much out 
about it. <laughs> they, they, they couldn't follow the ball. And, uh, and I remember one year they said, well, you, if you're going to run that play, you have to go tell the official you're going to run it. And so we did, and uh, and we ran it anyway, and it still worked, even though the other team was obviously looking for us to go talk to the official. So uh, we we're, we were kind of lucky, I think. The uh, the bounce pass lateral uh, across the field, Tom. That was that was pretty bold, even by your standards. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not as bad as you think because if you're on an artificial tur uh, surface, <clears throat> you're going to get a pretty realistic bounce. And uh, if you're on a grass surface, you don't know exactly where that ball is going to go. So, uh, yeah, it was a deal where uh, threw the ball to Mitch Crank. And, uh, but uh, I thought it would be wide open, but he was pretty well covered. And Mitch made a great, uh, great catch, and it was – thrown quite well. I think Irving Fryer threw the ball. And uh, it was not huge, but about a 25-yard gain and came at a good time. Tom, what was the process like in terms of game planning? Maybe back in, we, we talked about US, the USC game in, mm -hmm. in the 1970 season, and you, and you decide, well, I've got these trick plays or these exotic plays that I may use. Was that based on what you had seen? Was it was there extensive film study uh, fifty years ago, or or were you kind of putting together a plan and reacting in the moment? No, uh, we we would certainly. Um, I think most of those trick plays were used in games that were going to be tight, and you'd think maybe well you'd use them when you, you knew you're going to win easily, <laughs> but. Uh, if we felt it was going to be a tight game, then we'd gamble more in, in those games. And uh, I remember one time Alabama came up here, where Brian was a coach. And, uh, and it was, uh, I think they were rated first or second in the country. And we were rated quite a bit lower than that. And I remember we had a fake field goal and a couple other plays that we ran in that game, which enabled us to beat them. And, uh, and so usually it was a game that we felt maybe we were looking a little uphill to win. And that was the case out of USC as well. We, we felt we were going to need every, every break, every edge we could possibly manufacture to win. And, uh, and when that's your mindset, it really isn't a gamble. It's just, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to pull out all the stops. And, and, uh, and if, it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But uh, we want to get every edge we possibly could. Tom, this has been a, a tumultuous fall for mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, I'm just wondering how much you miss college football, how much you miss Husker football, how much this has changed your routine. Uh, you've lived through a lot of football seasons. I don't imagine you've, you've experienced one quite like this. Right. Well, I think when the, when the prospect of uh, – no Nebraska football season seemed very real. It, I think, gave a lot of people an empty feeling, and me, me too. And uh, because, like it or not, a lot of activity, social life, um, uh, psychological um, advantages are wrapped up in the football season for, for a lot of people. Not everybody, I understand that. But um, I, I felt really bad when it looked like that was going to be the way things went. And, uh, of course, we, we, right now we have a truncated season. You have eight games instead of 12, so you're only going to play two-thirds of the game that you were normally going to play. And it's starting awfully late. And one of the concerns I have right now is that they haven't left any, uh, any room for uh, virus cases. I mean, you're... You're playing every week, and I'm afraid that there's going to be a key game at some point during the Big Ten schedule where one or two teams aren't going to be able to play, and a certain game will not occur. And uh, it could lead to some controversy in terms of the Big Ten championship and possibly even uh, factor into how things are uh, come out on the, on the college football playoff.
That's right, Tom. You you served on the college football playoff committee. Can you imagine trying to sort through a season like this? I mean, I'm sure it was already challenging enough with everyone playing the same amount of games and right. uh, on a normal year. But how 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 would you go about trying to differentiate and decide on four teams yeah. this year? Well, they they always put a lot of stock in strength of schedule, and uh, so if you play eight games, it's going to be a little bit hard to leave somebody out who's played 12 or 13 games, uh, leave them out of the playoff and um, so and, and take somebody who's played eight games. Now, the quality of those games hopefully will be fairly good. And if a team goes through undefeated and you have a couple of other teams at the top that have a loss or two, then I can see a big 10 team getting into the playoff. But um, Probably, if you have if you have four teams that are undefeated and they play twelve game schedules, it's going to be really kind of hard to move somebody from an eight game schedule into the four team playoff. So it's going to be tricky, and I don't imagine that the champion of the Big Ten can lose a game and make it to the uh, to the playoff. So that would be pretty unusual if that happened. Tom, there was a probably the, the story of the season, uh, at least in the first few weeks, was just what the Big Ten was going to do, and uh, the indecision, uh, the confusion. I'm sure you can relate to that as a both a head football coach and as an administrator. Um, I, we've all picked it apart, but but what do you think could or should have been, been done differently back in August to just make the the situation more clear? Uh, for everybody involved? Well, I, I think you have somewhat of a blueprint, Dirk, and you're aware of it. The, the Pac-12 followed the Big Ten and postponing the season. And I think they came out with an 11 or 12 page summary, walking through everything they looked at, uh, all of the detail. And that was missing with the Big Ten. So I think there was uh, simply a statement, well, we're going to postpone the season with very little added detail. And I think, I think that probably added to uh, some of the uproar and some of the confusion. And uh, as you know, the lawsuit from the Nebraska players, you can perceive it as you want, but it seemed to pretty much smoke out the votes of the president's because at one time, nobody knew for sure if there even was a vote. And then you didn't know how they voted. And you can imagine uh, at uh, Penn State, at Michigan, at Michigan State, um, places where football is really important, at, uh, at Wisconsin, uh, to find out that your president uh, voted not to, to play the season this fall. Uh, obviously would really generate a lot of heat on those presidents. And so I'm sure that the, the lawsuit uh, was really kind of a pivotal event. And, uh, and I think it added to the intensity of the outcry. You had players, you had players' parents, you had uh, coaches who were talking about wanting to play, but nobody knew for sure who did what to scuttle the season. And uh, and to some degree, I'm sure maybe that has been, Nebraska has been held to account for that. And, uh, but I think everyone has a right to know when a critical vote is made, uh, who voted and how they voted and why they voted. And if there are some medical concerns, what were those concerns? What study did you look at? What, uh, what testimony was particularly effective in making that decision? And those things were not brought forward. And I think that really added to a lot of confusion. Yeah, Tom, you, you've been in a lot of those meetings and uh, kind of had the back and forth with, with other university leaders that maybe have a little bit different priorities than yourself at, at Nebraska when you were there. How... I mean, I guess, were you surprised to see a reversal just because 
a decision was made, and, and certainly Nebraska was vocal about its stance and maybe a dissenting opinion there on not to play, and yet the Big Ten did ultimately reverse course. I guess how unprecedented, how, how hard is it to, to go, I, I don't know, maybe go against the league is, is a hard way, is a wrong way to phrase it, but um, to continue to fight for um, something that you think should happen, even though it's a vote had already taken place. Right. Well, a lot of a lot of people were being affected uh, by that decision. There were layoffs in athletic departments, and uh, good people that lost their jobs. There were sports that were canceled, and probably many other sports that were on the verge of being canceled. And athletic departments were uh, losing huge amounts of revenue, and. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of players had their uh, NFL potential careers uh, somewhat put on hold, and a lot of parents were upset. And so there were a lot of stakeholders that uh, didn't feel maybe that their voice had been heard. And, uh, and I think they had the right to do so. But when the commissioner came out and said that the decision had been made and it would not be revisited, it seemed pretty final. And, um, and that's why I say that I think the pressure from the lawsuit, which caused uh, votes to be disclosed, uh, obviously those fan bases um, knew exactly who to, who to approach <laughs> once, once that information was made public. And I know that a, a big factor in the Big Ten's hesitance to go ahead and play was the uh, concern about cardiomyelitis, uh, the, the uh, cardiomyopathy, the idea that uh, the virus would attack the heart. And I think the SEC had a pretty good answer. They said, well, anybody that tests positive, we're gonna immediately give them EKGs and, and have continual monitoring of their heart function. And anybody that has a compromised heart condition is not going to be put back on the field until they're they're cleared, and uh, and so I think that um, there are a lot of answers to that concern because uh, almost any virus can theoretically attack the heart at some point. The percentages are very small, but I think that uh, that was one of the big concerns. And then of course the rapid uh, result test results was also. Um, and then I think the politicization uh, of the whole thing became a concern too, where some people didn't want to give the president uh, any credit or discredit or whatever. And so it became very confused. But um, again, I think if the Big Ten had come out like the Pac-12 and spelled everything out to start with, it might have made for an easier situation. Tom, how do you... Uh... I'm not trying to stir the pot here, but, but how do you think that this episode affects Nebraska's relationship with its conference peers and with the Big Ten office? Because, again, you've, you've been an administrator uh, mm -hmm. in, in healthy conferences and unhealthy conferences. And I'm curious what, what this past you know, couple months – and it's not just Nebraska, by the way. It's Ohio State. It's, you know, it's Penn State. It's Michigan. But, but – when you're trying to create cohesion within a league, what does an episode like this do to that long term? Well, I think it um, adds an element of instability, certainly. I don't think it's irretrievable, but um, I think also the concern might be, Dirk, that um, there are established long-term members of the Big Ten Ohio State was very vocal and uh, very proactive in trying to get the season underway. But they were probably seen as more a long-term established member than a school like Nebraska. And uh, so uh, that's unfortunate that it was that way, but uh, it seems like there's a, been a fair amount of flack thrown in Nebraska's way that maybe Ohio State didn't absorb. And uh, 
that's just my perception. And uh, so um, it, it is concerning. And one thing that has been something that I've noticed from day one was that in, in most conferences, at least in the old Big Eight, in the Big 12, you had a, um, a complete rotation of schedule. So you always played a certain, I mean, you had the, you always played the people in your division, and then you played the team in the other division, the South Division, North Division, in the Big 12, a certain number of times in a certain order. The Big Ten has tended to look more at TV, I think, sometimes, particularly as the, the, uh, the new television contract, which was done a few years ago, was coming into being Nebraska. If you look at the first couple of years that Nebraska was in the league, and I was the athletic director at that time, we played almost every high-profile team. They didn't have the East Division, West Division, and the leaders and the legends. But we, uh, we had a pretty brutal schedule there for two, three, four years. And, uh, and it wasn't just a, a normal rotation where everybody had the same shot um, across the board. And I think to some degree that has continued. So um, that has been a little disconcerting at times. It's just interesting, Tom, the, the, uh, the, the relationship that, that a school would have with a conference. And I, I don't know if, do you, I mean, maybe, maybe you can speak on this a little bit about being able to voice an opinion um, about a policy as a new member. Like, when, when is it, when are you, you, you mentioned kind of a, a lo more longstanding relationship, association with a conference that a, that a school like Ohio State would have. Like, could, could Nebraska officials speak out on, a, on an issue year one, or is it, do you have to wait till year 10, or do you have to win to do that? You know, how, how does it, uh, how do you get to a point where you've got some credibility behind your, your statement, I guess, if you're out publicly kind of going against a, a conference policy or, or, uh, or statute? Well, I don't know, John, that there's any, any set formula for being established, but, uh, the Big Ten is a very traditional league. You know, it's been around a long time. And one of the reasons Nebraska uh, chose to go to the Big Ten was because we thought the Big 12 was dissolving. You know, the South Division had apparently made a, an agreement in principle with Pac-12. So those six schools were going to go. And uh, Missouri was openly trying to leave. Colorado was openly trying to leave. And it looked like Nebraska, Iowa State, Kansas, and Kansas State was primarily going to be what we had left. And uh, so we liked the idea that the Big Ten um, had uh, stability and a uh, long-standing tradition and was probably not going to go away. And uh, so it was um, a little bit of a strange, strange marriage, you know. And they needed another school to have a Big Ten playoff game. They had 11 schools. In order to have a playoff, you need to have 12. So when Nebraska came into the league, every school in the Big Ten got a $2 million bump. I think they went from 20 to 22 million or something on their share. We went into the league getting what we had gotten in the Big 12, which was uh, 12 million initially. I was not part of that decision. And I raised Kane and Jim Delaney, to his credit, got a vote from the presidents. And because uh, we were going to get 14 million in the Big 12 uh, in the, the year that we joined the Big 10. And so they did go back and revisit. They had a re vote. And we got 14. But everybody else got a, an increase because we we're going to have a playoff game, you know. So they needed a, another team. And I think they took us possibly because we had a sold out stadium every year. It's a big deal. And because uh, we had had a fairly good football tradition and, uh, and other sports were strong too, volleyball, other sports. So anyway, um, at the time it seemed like a real good decision. And, uh, and hopefully uh, 
some of the things that have been upsetting here recently will will begin to heal over in some way. Tom, you mentioned the uh, the politicization politicization uh, of of what's happened here over the last couple of weeks. Um, and I think that's true beyond the big 10. I mean, there's been a, a merger of, of sports and politics uh, in, in lots of different ways that it, it is sort of reminiscent of, of what we saw in the 1960s. Um, one of the most interesting environments to me as sports, you know, uh, begins again is, is the, the football locker room, which is so diverse uh, in so many ways, you know, racially, socially, culturally, et cetera. And I just wonder, as, as these head coaches try to create chemistry within a locker room with all the external factors, whether it's social justice issues or uh, presidential race, <coughs> excuse me, how do you, how, do, how does a head football coach, you know, try to keep a team together in an environment like this when there's so many things going on? I think, Kirk, it becomes more difficult when the, the ideal situation for a coach and a team is to have a common vision and a, a common purpose. And uh, that is to be the best team you can possibly be, to achieve together somewhat unselfishly all that you can achieve. And the more distractions you have, the more you have one group going off in one direction, another group going off in another direction, or individuals uh, having different agendas, uh, the more difficult it is. And an example I might give you is that, um, you know, a, an NFL team, for instance, would win a championship. And then all of a sudden, some of the key players, each one would have his own talk show or his own uh, number of commercials. And, uh, and people would write a book and then you'd have uh, people capitalizing on that championship financially. And quite often the next year, you didn't have the same cohesion on that team because people were more interested in their own agenda. And so um, that is probably one of the biggest tasks I think a coach has is to keep people on the same page. And, uh, and on the same mission as much as they possibly can. And I think in the current envir environment, it's pretty difficult to do that. And uh, so uh, it's been kind of hard to watch because uh, you realize that there are lots of different uh, points of view and, and team unity, I think. And I think whichever team is able to hold together better is going to have a significant edge, and uh, and that's uh, not always just the result of the leadership of the coach. It has to do a lot with the leadership within the team. We had some teams where we had some team leaders like Jason Peter and Grant Wistrom and those guys, and they simply weren't going to tolerate anybody on that team uh, going off on a on a tangent and. Uh, and if you have that kind of leadership, it makes uh, makes things a lot better for the team. Well, before we let you go, Tom, I wanted to at least kind of get an update on, on your teammates' mentoring program. How have things mm -hmm. transpired over the last few months? As we've all adjusted to to the pandemic and, and switched up. I mean, we're on Zoom right now, so I imagine things have changed a little bit, but you guys have still tried to make an impact in the community um, how, how have things been going? Well, it's been uh, kind of a mixed bag, John, because um, we're currently in um, about 175 school districts. And some of those school districts are just pretty much operating as they used to. Some of them don't, don't have in-person classes. Some of them will allow outside people into the school. Some won't. So we're having to do a combination. We're doing a lot of in-person mentoring. We're also doing a lot of virtual mentoring. And, uh, and so uh, it's, been, it's been tricky and difficult to get all that lined up. But I would say right now, there's probably a, 
a greater need for mentors than we've ever seen because these last few months have been really uh, upsetting to kids. The, the normal routines are not there. And uh, you've got uh, kids who are doing classes at home. Uh, they're bored, they're um, distracted, and probably mental health issues and interpersonal issues sometimes between parents or whatever are probably more strained than they have been in a long time. So the, the role of a mentor today, I think, is more important than, than ever. And, uh, and it, uh, it's become more complicated. <laughs> and of course, one of the big things we try to focus in on is security. And we can't have a person on every Zoom call monitoring that Zoom call. I mean, we've, we've got hundreds and hundreds and eventually we'll probably have thousands of Zoom meetings. And uh, so we just don't have enough people to do that. But we do have them, those Zoom meetings recorded and we will periodically monitor. And if we begin to see anything that appears to be a little bit off base, then we can step in. And uh, so it's uh, the safety issues also become something that we're concerned about. And uh, so far we've mentored over 40,000 kids without a, a serious incident of, of harm to any mentee. And that's, that goes back over 27 years. So we're, we're proud of that, but we're also very concerned about that uh, at the present time. Tom, I got to ask you one more question about play calling. Uh, when Johnny Carson retired, he famously would submit jokes to David Letterman. Mm -hmm. And occasionally Letterman would, would read one of those jokes in his monologue. Have you ever felt the urge to send uh, to send Scott or Bo or Mike Riley or probably more likely Scott uh, a play call that or or a scheme that that is something that you saw on TV or something that you know struck you at a, during a sleepless night? <laughs> well, I, I might have had a, an urge to do it, but it always went away pretty quick. <laughs> you know, one of the one of the great things about my relationship with Bob Devaney was that uh, if you study the history book, very seldom did you have a successful coach like Bob who becomes the AD, who doesn't have a problem with the next coach because they, they want to intervene and they want to say, you should have done this, should have played this play or played this player. And Bob never did that, you know, and, um, and so I, I tried to be supportive with when I was AD and also just as a spectator, I try to be supportive. And I try not to tell anybody that this is what you ought to do unless they ask me. Now, if they say, you know, I've got this dilemma and what do you think? I'll say, well, yeah, I, th I think probably I would do this, but you're, you're the guy that's got to do it. And uh, if it doesn't fit with what you want to do, then uh, for heaven's sakes, disregard what, whatever thoughts I have. And uh, so I try not to intervene. Tom, you're one of the best uh, dry-witted joke tellers that I know. Uh, I've, I've seen you at lots of public events, and, and you've always got you know, a, a couple new ones. But uh, I, I can just imagine how much fun you'd have if you sent, you know, texted Scott a play that was a little bit outrageous uh, and you know, indicated that he really should call this on Saturday. I think you could have some fun with that uh, just by getting his reaction to it. Well... I might do like some of the fans used to, I used to get plays all the time. And there'd be maybe 12 players on the team. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, you can do a lot of really good things if you can play 12 or 13 players <laughs> against 11. So maybe I'll send him one of those. <laughs> well, we, we really appreciate having you. And uh, we hope uh, we all get to enjoy a, a somewhat normal college football season, uh, but we're we're always thankful for your time and uh, always look forward to talking to you. Thank you so much, Tom. You bet. Well, it's good to talk to you guys. We appreciate Tom Osborne's time. What a great interview that was. Uh, and the best trick play he ever called was convincing uh, – 
the state of Nebraska and the rest of college football that, that what he was doing was normal. And we've certainly uh, realized over the last 22 years that, that Tom Osborne was anything but. So we uh, are grateful for his time. And, I, you know, John talking to him, he's, uh, he looks ready for a college football season just like we do. No doubt. No doubt. I, I, I obviously always enjoy listening to his perspective. And I, I swear I've heard segments of thoughts that, that you know, he covered a lot in, in, in that conversation. I, I feel like I've heard uh, portions of that before, but it, it always seems fresh when you hear from Tom Osborne in different perspectives. And so we definitely appreciate his time. I'm, I'm still fascinated Dirk, that the Big Ten changed its mind and is allowing this season to, to, to take form in the way that it has. I mean, I thought for sure that once the uh, initial decision was made that um, there was going to be no college football in, in the Big Ten, that that was that. <laughs> but kudos to everyone who, uh, who, who fought for it, and, and now we get some football. Yeah, I think we're all crossing our fingers uh, that it's going to play out the way that it's scheduled. I mean, I, to me, the, you really want to maintain the integrity of this thing. And my, my concern is just that you, uh, that it's compromised in a way that, that you look back and say, wow, that wasn't even really worth it. Uh, and obviously that depends on, you know, good health and playing most of the games. I think if you could get in eight of the nine games uh, or seven of the eight, that would be a huge success. And, you know, if that means that you've got to be creative in how you – designate division champions and all that uh i think people would would accept it my concern is just that you have you know something happen where a team has to miss two or three games and then that really throws the schedule out of whack uh so we're all hoping it's going to depend on on good virus numbers across the big 10 and uh you know i think nebraska is they're they're as raring to go as anybody and they may not be as talented they may not be as experienced but I think they're going to be highly, highly motivated. And, uh, you know, I think if they play well, this could be a season that, that really gives them a boost, you know, going into 2021 when hopefully things are much more normal. And, and certainly those of us here in, in Nebraska are like, college football doesn't feel right uh, without, obviously, the Huskers. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm a Big Ten guy without seeing Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin on the field. It, 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 it hasn't felt right. So maybe there'll be a little bit of a normalcy feeling uh, this weekend when, when things get going. Dirk, before we leave, I kind of wanted to hear um, really from the expert here. Um, we, we obviously got some sad news recently uh, with the passing of Gail Sayers and Bob Gibson, two Omaha legends and, and two uh, sports stars that, Dirk, you've done a really great job sort of documenting and chronicling their careers. Uh, 24th and Glory was, was the book that, that you wrote and put together that highlighted some of that, uh, the origin stories for those two guys and several other Omaha legends. So I kind of wanted to hear your perspective on, uh, you know, just what it means that, uh, that those two uh, made the impact that they had and, and um, the legacy that they left. Well, I can't imagine uh, a town the size of Omaha producing two bigger stars than than Gibson and Sayers. I mean, they just to to do what they did in sports with the style and the sort of the the charisma that they did. Um, they were like magnets in the in the '60s. They were they were athletes that you couldn't take your eyes off of, and they did it at a time. Uh, where there was a lot of stuff swirling around them as black athletes and their community, uh, their neighborhood in North Omaha. So, you know, they, they sort of occupied the same, uh, the same stage, even though they didn't, you know, cross paths on it very often. But they just meant so much to Omaha. They meant so much to North Omaha. And for them to, you know, to pass – nine days apart, uh, was, was in some ways, um, uh, sort of appropriate because they were, they were such icons in this city. So I don't know, uh, based on, based on what they did and when they did it and where they grew up and the, the obstacles in their way, it's very hard to imagine, you know, two athletes who, 
who could mean more to this city than, than Gibson and Sayers. So uh, I know a lot of people mourn them when they passed and, and, uh, and, you know, the city's just gonna, I think, miss, miss, uh, miss them, but also miss sort of looking back at their accomplishments too. Well said, man. And, and, and the thing I would add is just what's, fascinating or been fascinating especially since y- your book actually kind of brought some of their stories to life again um was just how, how great, great they were and and how, how iconic, iconic. You know, i mean uh, bob gibson you hear all the stories about um sort of his sad sadder stature on the mound and the intimidating figure that he was uh not just for pitching inside and commanding the inner half of the plate but just being dominant and uh, Gail Sayers was unlike any other when he had the football in his hands. Um, poetry in motion, man, the way he ran. So it's, yeah. like, it's almost – it's still a little bit unbelievable that these two guys are basically from the same block. And, yeah. Uh, it, and they were icons. It's – you nailed it. I mean, it's it's not just that they were great. It's uh, – they were really unique. I mean, yeah. each of them was unique in sports. Baseball has never produced another pitcher – uh, comparable to Bob Gibson. I mean, he just had this, this aura of intimidation uh, that's really unmatched. I mean, Roger Clemens, Randy Johnson, maybe, but, it, but not quite the same as Bob Gibson. And, and Sayers, you know, people still look back and say, there's nobody who ever ran like Gail Sayers. With that reckless abandon, uh, his, his elusiveness and his quickness, uh, he was just, he was an unbelievable to watch in the 60s. He would have fit in fit into the NFL very well 50 years later, which is always a, you know, always a compliment to an athlete. So Gibson and Sayers, uh, I was really, really fortunate to, to get to know, you know their families so well. And, um, you know, Roger Sayers and Artie Sayers and, you know, the Gibson family, they were, they were very good to me and uh, really, really appreciative that, that we could sort of document some of that history that had been lost. All right, guys, episode one in the books. Go Big Omaha. We hope you enjoyed the, uh, the first rendition of our studio show. Like I said, this is hopefully going to be a whole sports department uh, venture, so you won't just see Dirk and my uh, faces every time and hear our voices. Um, hopefully you'll get to hear the inside of some of our other really talented colleagues as we uh, examine the sports scene and talk about the topics uh, of the day. Our goal is basically to do a few episodes that are really good and then pass it off. Just drop the mic and leave and not do any more and, and make Stu and Mike Patterson come in and do this. Exactly. So I don't know if this qualifies, but uh, we got one in the books. Go Big Omaha. <laughs>